Take a seat if you have one. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much. For, it's good to be back in Florida. And uh, I want to thank my good friend, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Congresswoman. She's been a tireless fighter. Where, where's Debbie? There she is. Thank you, Debbie. You've been a friend a long time. And thank you for uh, all the encouragement. And uh, Toby, I also want to thank you. Uh, Toby moved from a high rent district in Brooklyn. <laughs> That's the highest rent district in America right now these days. How are you, man? Good to see you. And I want to thank you for that kind introduction. And it's wonderful to be here with, with all of you to hear the stories, talk about how we're going to get through these tough times and the difficult times. Today's, uh, today's story is a familiar one here in South Florida. Uh, we're, all in, we're all living some version of, uh, of it right now with some of the most important parts of our lives being put on hold. And uh, the same story being lived by people uh, like, uh, like Carl Schechter, who many of you uh, know well. Carl's here today, I'm told. I don't know. All right, hey, Carl, how are you, man? Good to see you. I, the light was shining right in my eyes looking at you, man. I apologize. Carl is uh, 39 years old. No. 93 years old, but he acts like he's 39 years old. And uh, the pillar of this community, so much so that uh, a few years back, you all decided to rename this community center in his honor. I've heard wonderful things about you, Carl, and I'm looking forward to saying hello to you privately. You know, I had the pleasure of meeting Carl back uh, in 2012. He may not remember it, but uh, his story is what this community and this country is all about. Carl is the son of an immigrant. Carl served uh, our nation honorably in the Second World War, and met his sweetheart, Anita, when they were, they've been married now for 67 years. Together, they built a family, four children, seven grandchildren, and uh, more than 30 years, they made home here, staying engaged in all the local issues and holding local office, catching Sunday matinees and performances at the Arts Center and, the Center, and uh, socializing with neighbors, enjoying nights in the town, and a couple times, two, three times a week, going out. And, uh, but, but their story, like so many others, is a quintessential American story these days. It was, but it has been interrupted this year. Carl and Anita haven't been out, I'm told, to a restaurant in seven months. And there are no more Sunday matinees. Other than getting groceries, they spend most of their time in their apartment, like so many people do. It's harder than ever to spend time with the people you love, other than on Zoom or on a computer connection. Uh, we've all felt that sense of interruption in our lives, and we all know that this, uh, this isn't normal, that things didn't have to be this bad. They didn't have to be this bad. We look around at our neighbors, and we know people are hurting. A lot of folks are worried about making their next rent payment, their next mortgage payment. They're not only they, uh, whether or not they can purchase their prescription drugs or put food on the table. And we see an awful lot of people at the very top doing better than they've ever done and uh, left to wonder an awful lot of us is, who's looking out for me? Who's looking out for me? That's been the story, the entire story of my view of Donald Trump's presidency. The fact that he's never been focused on what matters. He's never been focused on you. His handling of this pandemic has been erratic, just like his presidency has been. And it has uh, prevented Florida seniors and people all across the country from getting the relief that they need. Donald Trump uh, hasn't just been willing to uh, not do the work. I think it's that beyond that. I'm not sure he cares about delivering any real help. I think it's both. The people say he's not willing to do the work. Well, I don't think he cares much about it. While you're losing precious time with your loved ones, he's been stuck in a sand trap in one of his golf courses. And when he does decide to lift a finger, it isn't to help you. It's to propose new tax cuts for billionaires. And I'm not, that's not hyperbole. That's not hyperbole. A hundred wealthiest billionaires in America are expected to get another $30 billion tax cut he's proposing. We know what happened the last time a tax cut was passed in 2019, or 2017, when he came into office. Pharmaceutical companies got billions of dollars in tax breaks. And then they turned around and raised prices for medicines that you rely on to stay healthy. And they're still doing it, even during the pandemic. And quite frankly, it's unconscionable. 
But Trump doesn't really care about lowering the health care costs because uh, he's beholden to the health insurance companies and the drug companies. After all, he's asking the United States Supreme Court, as I speak, he's asking them right now to strike down the entire Affordable Care Act, which would eliminate seniors' ability. Everybody, I, most of you are on Medicare. But it would eliminate your ability, and that act we passed, I was able to help put in place, was that you'd have preventative services and annual checkups and mammograms for free under Medicare. If it gets struck down, that gets wiped out as well. The rise in prescription drug prices for millions of seniors and putting Medicare trust fund at risk. And by the way, we used to talk about the Medicare trust fund. I say the Republicans want to eliminate it, but remember, Debbie will remember when he's not a bad guy in terms of his personality, but when the former Speaker of the House uh, became Speaker, what did they do? They proposed a half a billion dollar cut in Medicare from the start, right out the bat. These guys mean what they say. This President, as Debbie pointed out, has pledged to terminate the tax that's dedicated to financing Social Security. Terminate it. A Social Security actuary, not Joe Biden or a liberal think tank or a newspaper, this, the actuary that the Social Security says that would bankrupt Social Security in just a few years, putting those monthly checks for tens of millions of seniors that they rely on, and many of them, the only thing they rely on, at risk. All this President knows how to do is play games with people's lives and families' futures. Last week, he announced he was, quote, walking away from the negotiations that were never — he never fully engaged in, like he's not walking away, he never fully engaged in them — to provide any additional relief for American families. Debbie working like the devil in the House, they passed the HEROES Act. They passed two other pieces of legislation earlier to provide for the ability to keep people from going out of business, pe people being, like, being kicked out of their homes, et cetera. He turned his back on small businesses that are struggling to keep their doors open. He turned his back on firefighters and police officers and first responders who depend on local budgets, but local budgets are being broken and they have to be balanced. I'll just take note, make note here. When we inherited the largest recession, the greatest recession since the Depression, what happened? The President put me in charge of the Recovery Act, $800 billion. First thing I was able to do, and I was able to manage it myself, was that put $147 billion in help state and local authorities be able to balance their budgets, not have to fire police officers, not have to fire firefighters, not have to fire first responders, not have to close down health clinics. Local governments are strained to the breaking point. He turned his back on educators and school children, standing in the way of support to get them PPE and cleaning supplies and ventilation needed to reopen schools safely, which we could do if we funded it. He turned his back on every single worker whose job hasn't come back. And now he says he wants a deal. One day he's tweeting that the relief package is too big. The next day he's saying it's too small. It's all a game. He thinks he's still on his game show. Uh, no, really, he acts that way, for real. This is a political game he's playing. His latest gimmick, he wants to mail seniors a $200 prescription drug cash card with his name on it. So you're going to get it before election with his name on it. But what he's going to do, he's going to raid Medicare trust fund to pay for that $200, which seniors have already spent by paying money into. He thinks that he can take the money out of your pocket with one hand and put it back with his name stamped on it on the other hand and call it a gift. It's dishonest. It's reckless. And it doesn't actually help anybody. In fact, all it'll do is undermine the, the Medicare trust fund and increase overall out of pocket costs for seniors. Let's be clear about this. Donald Trump has tried for almost four years to lower he says he wants to lower drug prices, okay? But he hadn't done a single thing to do it. In fact, the House of Representatives passed a bill, Debbie supported, that would bring down prescription drug costs across the board, giving Medicare the power, the, in Washington, Medicare Department, the power to negotiate, to negotiate with the drug companies and say, we're not, if, if an aspirin is going to cost, if we're being charged, I'm making this up. 
And if an aspirin is going to cost two, two cents an aspirin, they say, we're only going to pay you a penny in aspirin. They're either going to do it or not. They're going to have to do it. We've been fighting to get, Debbie and I and others have been fighting to be able to do this for years. It would lower drug prices. What did President Trump do? He said, if it passes, he'll veto it, threaten to veto it. Folks, Donald Trump's chaotic and divisive leadership has cost us far too much. 215,000 dead from COVID-19 and rising. Experts say we'll lose nearly another 200,000 lives in the next few months unless he fundamentally changed course. You know, I wished, I prayed for his recovery when he got COVID. And I'd hoped at least he'd come out of it somewhat chastened. But what has he done? He's just doubled down on the misinformation he did before and making it worse. So many lives have been lost unnecessary because this president cares more about the stock market than he does about, you know, well-being of seniors. One day before we crossed the threshold of 200,000 deaths, you may recall this, the president was at a campaign rally, and he insisted that the virus was, and I quote, affects virtually nobody, quote, just elderly people with heart and other problems. Nobody. Think about that. Who was he talking about when he said it affects virtually nobody? He was talking about America's seniors. He was talking about you. He was talking about my family. You've worked hard your whole life contributing to society, building the family, building the country, serving America. You deserve security. You deserve respect and peace of mind. But you're not getting it. And by the way, if this wasn't so bizarre, you'd think, you know, if I tried to make a movie talking about something like this in America, you'd think I was making it up. Because Donald Trump, it's simple. Not a joke. You're expendable. You're forgettable. You're virtually nobody. That's how he sees seniors. That's how he sees you. It's no surprise. This is the same man who looks at Americans who put their lives on the line like you did, sir, and many others maybe in this room, for our nation, and calls them losers and suckers. I carry this card with me every day for the last 15 years. And the back, it's my schedule. On the back of the schedule, I have a black box. It says daily troop update. The number of troops who've died in Iraq and Afghanistan, 6,924. Not roughly 6,900, 924, because every one of these fallen angels left a family behind, deserves to be remembered. Every one. U.S. troops wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan, 53,000 as of today, 194. Every one. We've only one sacred obligation in America. To care for those we send to war and equip them, when they come home, take care of them and their families. And what did he say? Losers. My son volunteered to go to Iraq for a year. Before that, he had been in Kosovo for eight months. Best of my knowledge, the only foreigner has a war monument and a major highway in that country named after him for his contributions to helping them set up their criminal justice system. Then he volunteered to go to Iraq as attorney general for a year. My son was not a loser. And all those who left behind, he's passed away, but all those who left behind, they were heroes. They were patriots. I imagine that's one of the reasons why six four-star generals and a whole lot of others have endorsed me who used to work for him. Because they know where his heart isn't. That's how he sees us. That's the attitude he's brought toward this whole crisis. This is the same man, you may remember, when he was told we were averaging 1,000 lives lost per day. Remember what he said? He said, it is what it is. Such concern and empathy. It is what it is. Well, it is what it is because he is who he is. That's why it is what this is. This president, as Debbie referenced, back in January, 
when he was being briefed by the intelligence community. He said, I never read the briefing, didn't know what was in it, didn't have time. Well, the Saab, because ego moved him to try to convince a famous journalist to write something good about him. What happened? Bob Woodward interviewed him. He acknowledged that he knew it was a dangerous and highly communicable disease, but he did nothing. He didn't do a thing. He didn't tell you. He didn't tell any American. Why? He told Woodward on tape, he told Bob Woodward he didn't want to panic the American public. Americans don't panic. Trump panics. His reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis is unconscionable. The longer Donald Trump is president, the more reckless he seems to get. Thank God we only have three weeks left to go. Dr. Fauci, most respected doc in the country on these issues, you know, referred to the president's announcement on the Supreme Court and the Rose Garden using the White House as a backdrop for political events. He said it was a super spreader event. And how is Trump responding? He's running a national ad quoting Dr. Fauci out of context. Fauci had said way back in March, referring to public health officials across the nation, he said, quote, I can't imagine anybody could be doing more, end of quote, meaning public health officials. At the Trump campaign, which is not unusual because I've had a piece of it, Trump campaign has deliberately lied. They have put Dr. Fauci in their ad asserting that Fauci was talking about Trump when he said he couldn't have done any more. But Fauci's a man of integrity. After that ad came out saying, he said, I did not get permission to use that quote and I wasn't referring to the president. Even when after Fauci said that, he didn't say that about the president. The Trump ad campaign said they were going to continue to use the ad, knowing, knowing it was a lie. Can any of you ever remember anything like that in a presidential campaign with a mainstream candidate? And as a consequence to months of lying, misleading, and irresponsible action on the part of Donald Trump, how many empty chairs are around the dining room table tonight because of his negligence. How many people's hearts are broken? How many people have trouble going to sleep at night because they can't just reach over and touch? They can't hear their son or daughter's voice on the phone. While he throws super spreader parties at the White House, where Republicans hug each other, without concern to the consequences. How many of you have been unable to hug your grandkids in the last seven months? I got six of them. Two of them, my deceased son's boys, they live not, children, a boy and a girl, live not far from me. They can walk through the woods. The only way I can see them, I stand on the back porch, and they stand down, and, we, and I, I, I bribe them with haagen bars. But they, I, every single day, I contact them. But I can't hug them. I can't embrace them. And I'm luckier than most because they're nearby, those two of the six. My grandkids, your grandkids, who hope will grow up to treat one another with kindness, respect, and empathy, qualities the President has never, ever shown. It's become painfully clear as this careless, arrogant, reckless COVID response has caused one of the worst tragedies in American history. The only senior that Donald Trump cares about, the only senior is the senior Donald Trump. They don't seem to do anything for him. And by the way, you know, minority communities are getting particularly hit by this. You realize, as of about a month ago, on a percentage basis, 
one in 1,000 African Americans in all of America have died. And the estimate is, by the end of this year, one in 500 African Americans in America will die. One in 500. If he doesn't do something quickly and we hit 400,000, that is more people, the same number of people, that have died in the war you fought of all four years. 400,000 dead from World War II in less than a year if he doesn't move. If the only one Donald Trump will do anything for is Donald Trump. Look, folks, you all know it. We're so much better than this. We can contain this virus. We can fully reopen our economy. We can bring Congress together to pass real relief and then implement a comprehensive agenda to build back better my, my, my economic proposal. And by the way, it's not a liberal think tank or a democratic think tank that says this. An independent analysis put out by Moody's, a Wall Street firm, projects that my economic plan will create 18.6 million good-paying jobs between now and the end of the first term. Seven million more jobs than the President's plan. And create a trillion more dollars in economic growth than the President's plan. It's solid. It's real. Here's how my plan works. I'm not going to raise taxes on a single solitary American making less than $400,000 a year. You won't pay a penny more. It's a guarantee. But I'm going to ask big corporations and the wealthy to begin to pay their fair share to straighten out the tax structure. That money will allow us to invest in working people. I carry with me, I don't know if I have it with me now, I don't, a card that lists all of what is in the tax code. We went ahead, the President's tax plan, Brock and I were suggesting we reduce corporate tax from 35 percent to 28. That was the consensus. He reduced it to 21. You know how much that cost? $1.3 trillion. If we just take it back up to 28, it will generate $1.3 trillion more. Ninety-one of the Fortune 500 companies don't pay a penny in tax, not a single solitary cent. If we made sure there was a minimum tax of 15 percent, that would add another $400 billion. We're going to take this money and we're going to invest it in working people and a growing middle class and make sure everyone is included in the deal. I want tax re to reform the tax code because we're spending your tax dollars on the wrong things. As I said, Donald Trump, Trump cut the tax from 35 to 21, costing the Treasury a fortune. As I said, if we raise it back to 28 percent, $1.3 trillion will come to the Treasury over the next decade, instead of giving big corporations hundreds of billions in, to pay for buy back in, uh, buying back their own stock, moving jobs overseas. We should invest it in cures for cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. That's why I propose giving the National Institute of Health $50 billion over the next four years to go after cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. If we do not, and no drug company has the capacity to do it, if we do not find an answer to Alzheimer's, then in the next 19 years, every single solitary bed that exists in the United States of America now will be occupied by an Alzheimer's patient. Look, my dad used to have an expression. He'd say, Joey, if everything's equally important to you, nothing's important to you. You have to have priorities. What are our priorities? Our priorities is to make sure that everybody in America has an equal shot. This is about you. It's about what's fair. It's about what our priorities should be, and we can deal with the scourge of cancer and these other diseases. But Donald Trump has no interest. In fact, he wants to do the opposite. He proposes more tax cuts for the super wealthy. Like Donald Trump, we're going to ease the burden on major costs in your life, unlike him, including the financial burden of caregiving so many families are now carrying. 
Right now, as you probably know and you have friends, 800,000 Americans who are eligible for home community care through Medicaid, signed up for it, have been waiting an average of five years. They're waiting for a phone call back. For some, for some, five years. My plan makes a bold investment so the states can clear the waiting list. We'll also take the pharmaceutical companies. We'll allow Medicaid to, again, use its enormous bargaining power to negotiate prices for and bring the costs down for everyone, not just seniors. Give all Americans access to those lower prices. And what he also hates my doing, and so do the drug companies, we're going to establish a board, like as in other countries, of outside experts to set limits on the prices new specialty drugs that are life-saving drugs that cost an arm and a leg, figuratively and literally, that have no competition. This board is going to set up and say, this is how much you can charge based on what you've invested. You make a healthy profit, but you will not be able to raise the price of the drug without proof that you've taken other action that you have required you to improve the drug. So it can only be raised at the cost of medical inflation. Independent analysis found that my plan will slash the cost of prescription drugs by 60 percent. How many of you know somebody who's had to sell things just to get the drugs that have gone up exponentially? We're going to protect Social Security and increase benefits for millions of seniors. And I'll fight to protect your pensions, including fixing, fixing multi employer pensions so many Floridians earned and deserve. Folks, I guess I'll sit in with this. I'm confident. I know as bad as things are, we say, oh my God, how can it get better? I am absolutely confident we can do this and more. We just have to come together. I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I'm going to govern as an American president. I'm going to work as hard for those who vote against me as those who voted for me. That's the job of a president, a duty to care, to care for everyone. And after all we've been through, all America's accomplished, all the years that we've stood as a beacon to the world, we cannot let ourselves remain divided. But we have to vote. Go to IWillVote.com slash FL. You can still request your vote-by-mail ballot. The deadline's October 24. Request your ballot. If you have it already, mail it or drop it in one of the drop boxes today. Look. I'm tired of us all walking around with our heads down as if there's nothing we can do. This is the United States of America. There's not a single thing beyond our capacity. Nothing we've ever decided to do we've not accomplished when we've done it together. I remember when we were kids, we had to learn about the famous speech John Kennedy made about going to the moon. Everybody remembers the different pieces of it. The part I remember, my colleagues used to kid me in the Senate when I was there. When asked, he, answering the unasked question, why was he doing it? He said, because we refuse to postpone. We refuse to postpone one more day what's within our capacity as Americans to do. There's nothing beyond our capacity. There's no limit to our future. We got to stand up, lift our heads up. The only thing that can tear America apart is America itself. And he's well on the way trying to do that. Everybody knows who Donald Trump is. That doesn't know who we are. Who we are. We choose hope over fear, unity over division, science over fiction, and yes, truth over lies. We can do this, folks, I promise you. But you got to vote. May God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you for listening. You're a very patient audience. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. My, what am I going? I wish I could shake all your hands. Every time I used to walk out of my grandpa Finnegan's house up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother, when she was alive, she said, no, Joey, spread it. Let's go spread the faith. Thanks, everybody.